ground to build environment uh, in, the, in the habitat uh, program. And uh, some of them covering, of course, right from material to energy efficiency to zero waste, zero discharge, all of those things, I think we are, uh, we are uh, you know, we've done some of them and some of them are still underway. Uh, we have a very, very extremely uh, informed, knowledgeable panel panelists uh, today, um, and I thank them all. I welcome you all uh, for uh, being part of this panel. Uh, Dr. T. Prabhu Shankar, uh, who is the, uh, uh, the executive director of the Chennai Metropolitan Water Supply and Sewerage Board. We have Professor Bhairava Murthy, Executive Director, International Water Association. We have Dr. Sunita Purushottam, the head of sustainability, Mahindra Life Spaces, Life Space Developers Limited. We have Mr. Rajneesh Chopra, Global Head Business Development, VATEC Babag Limited. Professor S. Mohan, Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, and the Chair IWA. Uh, and of course, my own colleagues, uh, Nupur and uh, Tarishi and uh, the others who are this, helping them out uh, with this, uh, organizing this webinar. Uh, it's also, we are very proud that this webinar that we are doing today is being done in collaboration with IWA and of course with par under partnership with uh, MLDL and uh, uh, Wabag, uh, with uh, uh, VA Tech Wabag. So thank you very much for agreeing uh, to be here. Uh, the sustainable habitat program that I lead in Terry uh, primarily focuses on various sustainability aspects in the built environment, like green buildings, sustainable materials, fixtures, uh, thermal comforts, waste mitigation and management, and of course, as I said, uh, zero waste sites, including zero liquid discharge. The whole idea of organizing these webinars is to showcase the work being done uh, at Terry and generate suitable associations and partnerships in identified areas. Uh, and also, I think, under the during the pandemic time, uh, there is nothing better than a virtual platform where it's very easy to connect, where we don't require to travel across uh, to different cities and uh, uh, kind of uh, also set aside time uh, uh, to to make extra efforts to attend them. So I think it's it's in a way uh, we've been able to see a lot of interest generated amongst the various uh, both industry, academia, uh, policy and of course, research and development. Uh, I, it, it's been uh, very, very, uh, over, I, over the past couple of webinars, we've seen an overwhelming response. And also it's been a great knowledge exchange uh, program as well. Uh, as we move ahead to be future ready in case of the new normal, this session would focus on the need for sustainable approaches in urban water management, water benchmarking, decentralized waste water treatment technologies, rainwater harvesting systems, and improvement in water system efficiencies. The session would also focus on impact of upcoming and innovative water and waste treatment technologies for reducing the demand on fresh water, the best practices being followed among the Indian cities, uh, along with the focus on appropriate policy interventions. So with that, uh, I would, uh, I see that Dr. Mathur has joined and I would, uh, take, uh, you know, it's my privilege and honor to invite Dr. Mathu. Uh, sir, uh, if I could please have you uh, uh, say a few words, sir, and, uh, you know, say a few words on this occasion, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry that uh, technical uh, problems uh, uh, kept me from joining from the beginning, though I could hear uh, everything clearly on my end. Uh, first of all, let me welcome each one of you here the panelists, as well as everybody who has joined us, the 100 plus people who are with us at this time. And I think that what one of the things that the COVID-19 crisis has emphasized is the need for resource efficiency. Uh, whether it's energy efficiency, whether it's water efficiency, all of these things have become more important because looking at current expenditure has become important. Well, I'm particularly glad that we at Terry and the uh, 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 and the Sustainable Habitat Program at Terry is putting together and bringing together all of this, uh, all of these people, these distinguished panelists. We are glad that with, together with the IWA, we are organizing this event. 
and I am especially grateful that we have with us uh, the representatives of the IWA, uh, Professor uh, uh, Kalanithi, uh, welcome uh, here. I'm also extremely delighted that we have Sri Rajiv Ranjan Mishra with us, uh, who leads the uh, National Water Mission. Uh, uh, Mishra ji has been obviously with the Water Mission, but earlier he was with the Urban Development Department and consequently has the big picture of water use. I'm particularly grateful, Rajiv Ranjan ji, for the emphasis that you have put on demand side water management. For all of these years, the emphasis in water has been on the supply side, whether it was about creating dams, uh, the long distance canals of water supply, whether it was the inter uh, river linking of waters, all of our efforts were on the supply side. Now, this is not to say that supply side isn't important, it is. But there was zero effort on the demand side. And I think the emphasis on demand side is extremely important. The resource efficiency emphasis that we have seen in the, in the past few months highlights the importance. The fact that uh, we have gone in for this goal of achieving 20% water use efficiency is I think highlights the importance of this on the national stage. Whether it is through the Swachh Bharat mission, or whether it is the National Mission for the Clean Ganga or the Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and uh, Urban Transformation, Smart City Missions, all of them have emphasized both water supply on the one side and wastewater collection, treatment, and recycling on the other side. This is important to us. In Terry itself, through the Griha uh, tool, the Greha platform, which enables both uh, buildings and campuses and cities to become more resource efficient. We have tried to push both water use efficiency as well as wastewater management uh, through the creation of protocols that can help certify the kinds of actions that particular uh, developers or city planners take. Uh, so we are looking forward to this discussion on sustainable approaches to urban water management, uh, whether it is through decentralized water treatment, the rainwater harvesting systems, uh, water benchmarking, and so on. We look particularly, uh, Rajiv Ranjanji, at the kinds of opportunities that arise. Because at a pilot level, we have seen success. We would like this to be replicated at large scale. And consequently, what are the successes that have been achieved, as well as how we can both upscale and accelerate, I think, are the challenges that we face now. Consequently, this conversation around the best practices for Indian cities in relation to demand side water management is important, particularly with the focus on appropriate application of technologies and policy solutions. I am again delighted to welcome all of you here and look forward to a afternoon of extremely useful discussions that can take us the next step forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, sir. I think uh, you really set the tone for the discussions this afternoon. And before actually I invite uh, my colleagues to be making the presentation, I would uh, want to invite, since we have Dr. Mathur also here, uh, maybe request uh, Mr. Rajiv Ranjan Mishra, Director General, if he could want to uh, give some opening remarks before you chair the panel discussion, sir. Uh, would you want to make a few remarks, sir? <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mathur, uh, for all the nice words. And uh, you have really set the tone of discussion. Uh, I would very briefly mention, uh, rather I will relate or share my experiences of looking at water and urban sector earlier. See, these are the two areas, urbanization and water sector. Unless we really focus and unless we really take them very seriously, we are going to have a lot of problems. 
uh, you very rightly said that the covid has made all of us more efficient we all meet normally it would have taken much longer to meet each other physically and then so many appointments and other things would have been taken so similarly crisis makes us uh, has a potential of making us more efficient so without really creating a kind of panic but the way we have managed our cities and especially the way we have managed water in the cities actually we have lot to change things and and uh, perhaps uh, that journey has started with so many urban missions and also namami ganga mission and so, so many other initiatives which are being done uh, you are right when you say that we always look water as a kind of resource it is a resource but actually we have to look water in a very different way and especially when it comes to the rivers river is not just water it's not just carrying water it carries lot of things with us so it, it it has a very different kind of ecosystem this is the whole system so initially if you look at um, uh, the, the whole focus of dealing with water has been more upon uh, how much we can extract and we will not allow water to go waste into the sea and then we will utilize we will extract and utilize it for irrigation so that's the case of so many major dams major reservoirs and ultimately as you rightly say the supply side management of water has reached its limitation and then we have to look at other options and uh, even in the supply side we look at we have to perhaps look at the smaller ones the wetlands we have to rejuvenate wetlands we have to rejuvenate uh, our um, uh, traditional water bodies and we have to uh, perhaps look at some of those water sources which were some point of time water sources but now they have got so degraded that people do not really draw water from them so what can we bring that kind of supply by by using you rightly said policy and technology rightly so you, you can bring it back but the key lies in improving ourselves in the demand side management of water of course i would uh, like you to consider that we have to do both no one kind yeah. of solution will work so you will have to actually look at both in a sustainable way because sustainability is the key uh, where i will just uh, say few more words about uh, ganga rejuvenation program when namami gange was considered we had the advantage of some good research done by the consortium of iits and so many other institutions including terry i mean there there were so many institutions which were consulted by the consortium of iit and then perhaps uh, we had the benefit of looking at in a more holistic way than perhaps the previous uh, missions so what we actually looked at and how we conceptualized this whole program uh, and uh, you can put lots of interventions into pollution abatement what we very uh, typically call nirmal ganga then there are whole lot of things uh, which are basically to improve ecology and flow generally we call about aviral ganga or making ganga nirmal and aviral so i think that becomes very important and that is where actually lot of demand side water management thing which we are talking we have started discussing them in the aviral ganga component then again you will all agree that only technology and policy guidelines won't really work you have to actually look at the stakeholders and especially demand side management requires a lot of behavioral change aspect of people people and institutions so you also look at connecting people with the river connecting people with the water and then having a good kind of research base good kind of knowledge base with institutions like terry institutions like iit wii and other other institutions so i think that was the kind of perspective with which uh, this uh, whole thing was uh, generated we are going to talk little bit about waste water about reuse in our discussion so we actually very clearly looked at what happened in the waste water sector unfortunately again our cities have urbanized and we are going to urbanize more but the planning urbanization has not been so much with the plan so we have lots of issues and our cities are really very complex they are, they are the engines of growth we call them but they are also very complex you will have to look at multiple solution to look at water uh, whether it is drinking water or waste water or storm water actually there is need to look them look at them more holistically and do it so what we have done uh, at least for the waste water few initiatives i would like to say are we try to consolidate and look at long term perspective of operation and maintenance of all the gstps because when we started this program we realized under previous programs so many stps were constructed but actually roughly about 1000 mld capacity was created but roughly 50 60% of them were not working so the issue was what do we with them we do uh, with them in this mission we tried to carry them also forward with us so we actually organized a kind of conditional assessment through professional bodies to really visit all the stps assess their potential and what is the feasibility of reviving them 
Based upon that, when they started taking up new projects, we also included in the same city those projects also which were the earlier assets. So this right. program actually looks at reviving and using those assets. Uh, and after that, uh, we looked at a kind of 15-year uh, perspective of ONM to become part of the project. So that's again bringing a kind of long-term commitment of the construction or the concession agency. We looked at PPP, we introduced hybrid annuity mode of PPP, where 15-year annuity is there. So the person has to do good job unless his performance is good. He is not going to recover his own money because he gets only 40% during construction. So slowly we have tried to get into a kind of performance-based payment system or performance-based contract. And then later on, we also tried to look at a kind of city-wide concept, like look at a city and then go for a kind of one city, one operator approach where actually you try to consolidate, try to look at the old assets, try to look at the gap area and then what assets you have to create. So I think that, that, that model is actually working well. And several of the projects in Kanpur, Prayagraj, Mathura, some of these important places, we have actually gone into the one city, one operator mode. So that's again something very uh, unique. Uh, we also have tried to take uh, champion the cause of reuse of treated wastewater and other byproducts. So we have a project in, uh, in Mathura where 20 MLD of treated wastewater is being sold to Indian Oil Corporation. So I think it's not that the model is only here. They, this kind of model is existing now in the country at various places. But in the Ganga area, this was perhaps one of the first thing. And then Mathura Refinery or Indian Oil is actually paying for the 75% uh, of the construction of TTP and then ONM they are going to bear and they will also pay for the water which they are going to do. So I think we are trying to create, to try to generate some additional source of water and then manage our demand with that. So the, the pressure on fresh water comes down. Uh, th these are some of the things and then we are trying to again as you rightly say the policy policy for reuse various states have got policy Gujarat has a policy Haryana has recently come up with a policy and then similarly various other states are also working on them a kind of national policy framework will help us our ministry has come up with some policy guidelines so we are actually trying to work with uh, the various ministries and actually drive this kind of policy various states have actually done good work in this so those states experiences will be very very useful to share and take it forward uh, coming very quickly to the more on the water flow aspect so that is where actually it becomes very important uh, to look at demand side and that is where we have started looking at it. So primarily what we are looking at, you have to look at the entire basin, you have to look at uh, some sort of environmental flow regime. We have done it for Ganga at least from um, up to now from the source of Ganga, there, there is an environmental flow regime. We have started implementing it. We are working for Yamuna, Ram, Ganga and some of the other rivers. Uh, thanks to NGT directions uh, to all the states on the polluted stretches of rivers. So various other states, I am really very happy when we have a monthly meeting with various states, not only Ganga, because NGT has also told NMCG to review with the help of um, a central monitoring committee. So I think uh, all these things have through judicial order also has gone and various states are now looking at this. Another important aspect is floodplain. So floodplain rejuvenation, floodplain protection becomes very important because wetlands and biodiversity, all those things are there. And then on the floodplains, we have actually, we are trying to map them with the LIDAR mapping to really delineate states are working. But often our development gets into floodplain and encroaches that floodplain, especially in the urban context. And we have several examples, all of you are very much aware. So unless we protect, unless we protect and guard the floodplain and the groundwater, aquifer recharge, they are all long-term problems. And you know now the cities, unfortunately, the way we have managed, there are cities which is on the bank of a river, but they actually transport water through canal system or the pipelines 200 kilometers away. I mean, the Agra is a very classic case, I will tell you, it's on the bank of Yamuna, but the pollution of the Yamuna and then the quality and quantity of water in the flow in Yamuna is such that now there is a drinking water scheme transporting Ganga water to Agra. I think that there cannot be a bigger irony than this situation, the way we have not looked at the sustainability and that's how that's how we have to um, look, look at uh, those kind of things. So when we looked at that, we also looked at agriculture because you have to look at water use efficiency. First of all, water is coming down and you are also not using it efficiently. So that that's really a very serious thing and then with the help of national water mission, some targets, and then we are working with agriculture ministry. It's a very long way to go. 
about right kind of cropping about right kind of um, uh, technology on micro irrigation and other kinds of things that's a big area to work and then save water reduce abstraction because then only you can have good um, uh, water availability in the country wetlands are very important so we are also looking at rejuvenating wetlands urban wetlands are again very important because they are prone to encroachment i think uh, um, uh, from chennai uh, uh, Rahul Sankar is there, so he would have enough of experience of how wetlands or the water bodies get encroached, and then the channels are all blocked. So we also have less of water, and sometimes we have so much of urban floods. So I think that's again something which we have to look at. Uh, rain water is very important source of uh, water for us. We all know climate change. I mean, in this forum, I need need not really tell that it has become erratic. overall rainfall might not have reduced substantially but suddenly you will get lot of rain suddenly you don't get rain so i think it's very important to work out a good strategy and implement that building bylaws have rainwater harvesting but to what extent we have been able to implement can it become people's movement can we use institutional uh, in, uh, support for this what kind of institutions uh, you know there are several institutions having huge amount of land uh, available with them and this year we have actually launched catch the rain campaign uh, from national water mission and nmcg all of us are part of that and you will be very happy to know that several of big institutions like uh, army air force armed forces railways they have huge extent of land universities we are trying to tell them that. one thing is the individual level we have to do but actually you have to re really scale it up at that level because that will actually bring you uh, more water so that that's again something which has become a very important thing but as we are going to deliberate and there are very evident very knowledgeable panelists uh, we always talk about water efficient fitting water efficient building construction then during construction during operation and maintenance what kind of things we can do first of all we all i mean the real estate sector has can really contribute quite a lot and then in the ncr region actually we are trying to work out with some of the real estate developers to actually adopt some of the water bodies and actually other day in one of these conferences only this idea came and magic mix actually they are now trying to work with us and we are trying to develop a program can be really rope in what they can do see it's also in their own interest if the water body around their properties are healthy actually value of their property also improves so i think there is lot of potential to do all these uh, uh, several of these um, uh, things and just to end i will also tell we are actually trying to look at all of them holistically and then with the help of national institute of urban affairs and iit we are trying to work out and also spa spa delhi which is actually preparing a guideline for urban wetland uh, rejuvenation protection etc uh, we are trying to look at uh, um, uh, more on the integrated urban water management rather urban river management plan so suppose you are a river city you are working in a river city look at the river look at the other river cities downstream upstream and then can we think in a more holistic way look at what are the different sources of water do a kind of water audit for that city how much you get how much you reuse what happens to the reuse of um, uh, reuse of the treated water what are the various areas and then how much waste you are generating how much is being treated and then look at sewage look at septage look at various options and come up with a more holistic plan including the river front management because flood plain and river front becomes very important so i think that is the kind of um, um, approach we are looking and uh, i am really very happy to be with you because uh, the the concept the, the theme of this um, discussion and then the kind of panelists we have it's a very good uh, combination of uh, top academics top technical brains practitioners from the field uh, whether it's from administration or from business or from corporate so all representatives are there in this group and some of these things which we are doing this debate is necessary this uh, this whole uh, uh, approach needs to be discussed again and again and we ultimately need to come up with the solutions which are more pragmatic which can be implemented even if we start with a small um, uh, scale uh, if we succeed there is a potential of uh, scaling it up we have seen it in the case of navami ganga several projects we have been able to complete and we have been able to now start replicating it for the other rivers not only in the ganga basin because that's any way under navami ganga for other river also we are trying to develop Uh, at this point of time when we are in the midst of rain water harvesting campaign jal shakti abhiyan is there jal jeevan mission again i think i must mention about another um, uh, initiative of government about um, bringing drinking water to the uh, rural areas 
similarly amrut program is also going to translate into another program like jal jeevan mission urban like you have swachh bharat mission gramin and urban similarly it will be there so there will be huge uh, emphasis on drinking water but that drinking water cannot really be available unless you become unless you are the source of water become sustainable so i think the sustainability idea whether it is construction whether it is real estate whether it is urban area rural area it actually is required everywhere and we need to do lot of things at the level of policy at the level of technology development at the level of actually carrying it out actually through business through corporates so uh, the, the, these kind of consultations these kind of uh, debate uh, i am quite sure will help us in taking it forward and uh, really uh, really uh, i look forward to further debate so uh, at this stage i will stop and uh, maybe request sanjay to go ahead with the presentation and then i look Thank forward you. to further joining you during the panel discussion thank, thank you thank you very much sir thank you i think for providing that holistic perspective uh, and uh, yes uh, so it's again as i said we at terry look forward to working very closely with your departments and uh, also uh, we have been as we all see that we have a, a very esteemed panelists very diverse cross cutting i would request my colleague uh, dr nupur Uh, to please take forward the uh, the discussions uh, nupur over to you thank you very much thank you sir uh, good evening all and on behalf of uh, iwa and being a terryite so i proudly represent both the partnering organizations here so i welcome uh, all the panelists and all the delegates who have joined us and uh, now quickly going to the presentation i would request uh, my colleague tarishi to begin and i'll follow uh, i'll proceed from there so tarishi over to you i'm sharing the screen thank you ma'am good afternoon uh, everyone so uh, in today's webinar we are going to discuss on the mainstreaming demand side water management in indian cities uh, and yes in indian cities and uh, before i go on to that uh, first i would like to uh, begin with that what are the reasons that we need to decide we need to design a demand side water management approach the current um, scenario the future projections of the india's water availability demand and supply next so if we look at the water availability in india the per capita water availability is on a decline post uh, if you can see from the graph uh, in 2011 the per capita water availability it went down to uh, 1544 cubic meters which was um, uh, very below uh, the global standard of 1700 cubic meters making india a water stressed country and it is expected that by year 2050 it will further go down to 1140 cubic meters which is very uh, close to the official water scarcity uh, threshold of 1000 cubic meters making india a water scarce region next slide please now secondly if you look at the water demand in india sector wise in all the sectors be it irrigation industry energy domestic in all the sectors the water demand is on a rise due to rapid industrialization and uh, urbanization in fact it is projected that by year 2050 the water demand is going to reach at uh, 1180 billion cubic meters uh, which will surpass the average annual water availability of india which is 1122 billion cubic meters which means that the water demand is going to become more than the water available both surface and ground water sources next slide and now looking at the water demand settlement wise the uh, urban water demand the rural water uh, demand and the uh, average domestic water demand uh, are increasing rapidly as you can see from the graph in fact the urban water demand is going to reach um, at 220 lpcd in 2050 which is uh, higher than the national building code standard which ranges between 150 to 200 lpcd for cities having population more than 1 lakh a point to be noted here is that this is average uh, water demand 
and the per capita water supply it ranges uh, uh, between as low as 40 lpcd to as high as 400 lpcd so there is an inequitable distribution of water in the city now if you look at the last graph which shows the relationship between water supply and demand um, uh, you can see here that in the year 2008 the water demand and supply were quite equal to each other in fact the water demand uh, the water supply was slightly higher than water demand uh, indicating that the water scenario was uh, stable. But it is being estimated that um, by year 2030, in just next 10 years, the water demand is going to become twice of the water supply. And this can be very well attributed to the fact that the water availability is declining, as I just showed you in the previous graphs. So these statistics clearly show that uh, the situation is alarming. Uh, with respect to the water availability, demand, and supply in India. <clears throat> so what is the solution for this? So uh, to address this uh, solution, there are uh, uh, two potential responses. One is on the demand side and one is on the supply side. Now, supply side water management, if you see, it is, approach, uh, it is an approach where we try to tap more and more water resources to meet the increasing water, uh, increasing water demand. And it is a structural approach which focuses more on developing the infrastructure like dams or reservoirs and uh, inter-regional water transfer schemes. Now, this is very energy intensive and it is very costly. And a lot of studies have shown that it has uh, implications on the environment as well. Now, if you look at the next um, approach, which is the demand side water management, this can be defined as an approach which aims to best utilize the water, which is already there, which is already available. It is a non-structural um, uh, approach, which is more inclined towards the end user and the water saving uh, technologies and infrastructure. So this dominant discourse of um, uh, increase, uh, tapping more and more of water resources to meet the rising water demand, that needs to change. Uh, there is a need of a paradigm shift from the supply side water management to demand side water management. So deliberating on this further. So um, uh, the first, the very much, the, the most important part is the stakeholders who are involved in this. The role of the stakeholders are very crucial. Now, uh, the stakeholders in the demand side can be divided into three categories. So we have policy development and implementation, water system and infrastructure design, and the end user. So, um, Bodies like central and state governments, urban local bodies, water boards, and parastatals. So these are the bodies which basically uh, design policies, rules and regulations, and also ensure its implementation. On the second category is the water system and infrastructure design. So basically, uh, infrastructure like water pipelines, water and sewage treatment plants. So these are designed by the architects, the civil engineers, and various consultants. So these are the second category. The third category is the end user. So where basically the water is actually being consumed. So a lot of other stakeholders like RWAs and facility managers and the end user that uh, forms the part of the third category of the stakeholders. So now if we look at the demand side water management framework, so it basically has five major measures, five major areas. So that is regulations, technical, operational, economic, and behavioral. In regulations, it basically focuses on the legal framework and regulatory tools. Technical me measures basically focus on reducing the water losses and um, uh, enhancing the water usage uh, through using water efficient fixtures. And also it focuses on reducing the freshwater demand. Operational measures are the ones uh, which basically deals with the capacity building of the staff who are managing the water supply and the universal custom metering to ensure the economic uh, usage of water. Now, both these technical and operational measures can be implemented uh, both at the design phase as well as the operational phase, which means retrofits and maintenance. The uh, fourth part is the econo economic uh, measure. Now, uh, this basically means that the that uh, financial rewards can be given to people who uh, who are using the water judiciously and positively, like in the form of sub subsidies, etc. And uh, penalties can be also imposed on the ones who show undesirable behavior, 
who are wasting water and are responsible for leakages as well. The last uh, measure is the behavioral one, which basically focuses on modifying the um, uh, use of water by people uh, through sensitization. So this entire demand side uh, uh, water management framework is an integrated part of the entire urban water flow management system, which starts from the water resource management, that is tapping off water uh, resources, and uh, it goes on to water distribution and supply, then the end user where the water is consumed, and then back to return flow management. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So, uh, so the statistics that I just showed you about India before, now that secondary data can be backed by the primary uh, study that we had conducted here at Terry under Mahindra Terry Center of Excellence. So in this study, we had actually, uh, did, we did a study on water use and sustainability assessment, both at the micro level and at the macro level. So micro, micro level was basically at a building level uh, um, and the macro level was at a, uh, at a city level. So, uh, so we conducted the water audit of residential townships, which is at the micro level. And uh, some of the major findings that we had collated uh, for enhancing the demand side water management at the micro level uh, is presented here. So firstly, there was um, use of uh, water efficient faucets and fixtures and irrigation equipment that has a potential to reduce the water demand by 30 to 60%. Secondly, use of uh, UV, UF uh, technology, domestic water purifiers instead of ROs in locations where the supplied water is municipal and the quality of the water is already within the prescribed norms. So there it can ensure the reduction in wastewater discharge from the RO purifiers. Thirdly, uh, use of treated STP water for non-domestic applications like flushing and landscaping and backwash purposes, that has also, uh, that can also reduce um, the uh, freshwater demand. Fourthly, the water submetering um, for uh, at an individual house level and at the inlet outlet of the private STPs uh, in the residential townships uh, in this case can ensure the efficient monitoring and record tracking of the water systems uh, so that the uh, it can arrange it, it can encourage the proactive conservation by judiciously using the water and help plan efficient reuse and distribution in various uh, non-domestic uh, applications of the treated STP water. Fifth, which is also a very important point, which is a rainwater harvesting systems. Now it can be used for two purposes. Either uh, it can be used for uh, reuse through storage tanks or for the groundwater recharge through pit. This, cannot, uh, this can not only enhance the groundwater levels, but also help in reducing the strong water runoff, which can actually um, help in controlling the urban floods as well. And locations with which have acute water shortages, they can also meet their water requirements through these uh, harvesting systems. Next slide. Now, uh, this, uh, this next is the water sustainability assessment of cities, which was done at a macro level. And these are the findings. Uh, first is the refurbishing the old and defunct water supply network it has the potential to reduce the distribution and transmission losses through leakages. Secondly, 100% uh, coverage of metered connections across the city can ensure a fair revenue collection and also a controlled usage of the water. Modification of consumer behavior through awareness, public education programs, through various medias like social media, digital, ele electronic media, etc. This can enhance the efficient water usage. Fourthly, capacity building and training of the existing as well as the new recruits. That is very important in the government staff, in the municipalities, boards, and other parastatal working in the water supply management. Uh, I, I think the, I cannot see the screen uh, anymore. Dr. Nupur, are you there? Hello. Okay. Hello, ma'am. Are you there? Oh, yes, I got uh, connection. So, have you finished? Uh, ma'am, can you share this uh, uh, presentation again? Yeah. 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 
Yes. Uh, so the fourth point is uh, the capacity building and training program. Uh, that should be very strengthened upon uh, because that can eventually help in strengthening the work practices of the staff and also improving the overall performance and development of regulatory tools to ensure the adoption of the water demand management measures. That is also very, a very crucial point. Next slide. So uh, moving on, so in the next phase of the Mahindra Dairy Center of Excellence, we are actually planning to uh, develop uh, zero liquid discharge sites and uh, establishing decentralized wastewater treatment systems. And to do that, in fact, in Terry, we have uh, developed our own uh, wastewater treatment technology known as TADOPS, on which uh, Dr. Nupur is going to explain further. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Tariji. You have set uh, very well the tone for the discussion and uh, overall how we are working in uh, um, a sustainable habitat program. So now I begin with a uh, very quick presentation on, uh, I'll just share the screen. Is it visible? Yeah. So this is uh, Terry advanced oxidation technology to enhance water use efficiency, industrial and municipal sewage wastewater. Just a brief about uh, this work, uh, how it has begun. Uh, it, it actually began with my own PhD from IIT Roorkee in the area of photochemistry and photocatalysis, where we de developed uh, systems for treating organic pollutants at the point source to abate point source pollution. And during my postdoctoral research as a scientist in CSI and National Physical Laboratory, I extensively worked on nanotechnology, nanomaterials. So now at this third stage of my research, I have explored both my prior experiences and come up uh, uh, with this. And uh, the time, uh, I would say, was 2014 when the Namami Gange mission was launched. And it was at that time when I, as a scientist, thought how to contribute in nation building. And it was the, uh, high, I was highly inspired by Namami Gange mission uh, program. And here, this is the vision which I look forward to contributing in nation building through missions of national importance like Namami Gange, Water Conservation, Make in India, and Self-Reliant India. So the mission, the work actually aims at development of integrated approaches, which curb point source pollution abatement, which then help achieve ZLD, zero liquid discharge, in much affordable, sustainable, resource and energy efficient manner, and enhance water use efficiency. So here, if you look at the slide, this is from NMCG. And here, if we look at the aim, uh, we aim at the point source pollution abatement, the industrial and municipal sewage. And these are the implementation sectors and our entire, the target of our technology endeavor is the target pollutants, which involve any stream having color, COD, TOC, pathogens, and POPs, the persistent organic pollutants. So this is our target. And with this, this one slide is just uh, here to assess the gaps in the current wastewater treatment. So uh, after since 2014, after visiting several industrial effluent ETPs, STPs, and knowing from the industries, what are the gaps, what are the challenges which we have? So the primary thing which comes to um, fore is the, we are treating different kinds of kinds of wastewater with similar protocols. This is a big uh, something where we have to look upon. We have to understand the nature of the uh, nature constitution of the effluent and accordingly treat. And secondly, when this uh, this uh, one slide could bring in a lot of insight on the gaps. So first, this is a just one example of any coloration industry. This is particularly of textile, and the reference is cited below. So here, what you see is. Uh, the first is the physical chemical treatment in which we are using a lot of chemicals and not just large number of chemicals, we are using large amount of chemicals. So which ultimately leads to sludge generation, which you can see on the top right, a large number, a huge amount of sludge, which is toxic in nature. Then we secondly, when we, we rely on biological treatments a lot, then after this second, uh, we are passing through sand filter, activated carbon filter, and ultimately this constitutes a secondary treatment. And then we are reaching this orange color water, which is majorly 
the water uh, obtained after secondary treatment. So MSMEs have the problem here, what to do, but the large scale industries who can afford tertiary treatment, which, which comprises of RO and multi-effect evaporators, so they can do. So now here you see after even second, third and fourth, the treated water is still having high color and high COD. And this water goes to RO and RO has a few cycles and it has a reject, which goes to multi-effect evaporator, even that has the reject and that is finally um, it goes for uh, drying, solar drying or other ways of drying. So ultimately what we see that we are simply converting pollutant from one form to the other or another. But so overall this treatment is highly unsustainable in the present context. So here at Terry, we are working on the secondary innovation in the secondary treatment component so that tertiary load on tertiary could be reduced. So here, this is Terry advanced oxidation technology. The, uh, mainly you can see uh, all the st stages. One is the physical chemical, which we do. Here also innovation is that we are not, we have come up with very novel formulations, not using alum ferrous kind of uh, uh, coagulants and flocculants. They are the real culprits for sludge. Second stage, stage two involves advanced oxidation processes, which are the processes which generate hydroxyl radicals. So any process which generates hydroxyl, it could be through photofender, uh, fender, ozone, and all these are used. But here we are using nanomaterials, the intrinsic property of nanomaterials, which we are using for the purpose. And you can see it's a process and also a product, a photocatalytic reactor having suitable light radiation sources through which um, nanomaterial is mixed. I'll come in the next slide. And then the nanomaterial after treatment is completely recovered and then water point of use is available if required goes for the tertiary treatment. So here you can see just one this slide where you can see the uh, property of nanomaterial is used. Here the sec uh, this is a uh, semiconducting nanomaterial in presence of light they generate ROSs, the reactive oxygen species and the highly oxidizing hydroxyl radicals which develop in situ means you are not adding externally, you are not adding chemicals externally to generate these radicals. And this is used, so it is oxidatively degrading into smaller compounds and finally it is mineralizing. So you can see the potential and hydroxyl radicals being highly oxidizing, they are highly efficient, they are non-selective which means they can treat a large number of wastewater streams and having a UV, they can go for the waterborne pathogen inactivation, which is coming in the next slide. This is very important in the present context when we are talking about wastewater, through wastewater surveillance, the presence of viruses and other kinds. And this is the biggest uh, application in the present context that this technology um, helps in waterborne pathogen inactivation. And vis-a-vis -vis what we saw earlier, here is the TEDx implementation in the same industry. Uh, I'm audible, uh, Net is there. Hello? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Please continue. Yeah, Please. you are audible. Yeah. So this is uh, the same implement textile sector. And this one slide shows the difference. Here, as, you, as I have uh, narrated, step one is the a very innovative physical chemical treatment methods. And here, after stage one, we are uh, working with nanomaterials and our, uh, it is the photocatalytic action which is taking place in the reactor. And here we are filtering, uh, suitably filtering nanomaterial. And this is the post stage three, you can see this is the water which we are getting. And here are the nanomaterials which are re uh, regenerated and reused up to few cycles. And also you can see the with the innovation of uh, stage one, the, the, the reduction in quantity of sludge and the quality of sludge, which is majorly, it highlights the hardness of water which has come out. And the third important point, which uh, is that now this color, this uh, COD reduced, 90 to 95% COD reduced and color gone, complete color decolorized water and 40% TDS reduced water now goes to the R, which eventually uh, help in uh, lifespan of RO and on the tertiary, overall load on tertiary treatment is reduced with this integration component and hence uh, ZLD becomes much sustainable overall. This is a publication from our own uh, recent publication, Journal of Water Process Engineering.
so based on whatever we have done so far and also the zld we are achieving the zld parameters the b is the finally treated water ready for reuse in the same industrial sector so based on this science what we have done is industrial based water and uh, sewage based water these are just two slides so here the uh, idea is that uh, for streams which have high cod high chemical pollution we can implement tedox kind of advanced oxidation at pre biological stage and continue with the conventional biological so here are two examples of a chemical industry waste water highly phenolic you can see the reduction in cod and this ratio bod by cod is indicative of biodegradability which means with implementation biodegradability has enhanced to 4 to 5 times these are the two sectors which we have done category 2 is post biological or at polishing stage so here you can see a tertiary treated effluent from a pharmaceutical company in uttarakhand which is this is a treated water going into the ganges and just the tedox treatment at polishing stage has changed the water characteristics and this is a tannery water from kanpur site same water is being discharged into the ganges and here is the intervention post biological or at polishing stage this is a third category which we have generated from our work is that no biological we are bypassing bioremediation so these are the examples of uh, textile units from sonipat haryana this is from guntur andhra pradesh here you can see direct 5r treatment and direct raw cv raw effluent is converted into reusable water and we are able to achieve a dd in this way and when this is applied further we have extended this idea to a cetp a textile cluster of 11 to 12 units where you can see this change and here the idea is if you can improve biodegradability you can put it at pre biological this is this and here you will see our technology in this in industrial waste water space if we compare our technology with existing technologies in terms of cost efficiency clean and green approach secondary pollution abatement and sustainability we stand out on all these five parameters here just one slide this is on the sewage municipal sewage waste water here what you see is the uh, sewage of the inlet directly and on top you can see the uh, conventional biological treatment comprising of mbbr uh, sand filter and activated so this is a very common scene in india in households in residential complexes in malls everywhere this is the way we are treating the sewage is coming up as compared to this if you see the parameters also here uh, all the you can see the change and this is in comparison with the conventional this is the tedox treatment you can see the quality of water and the time of uh, treatment has reduced substantially and the best the usp of this work has been on the micro pollutants for which we don't have cpcb discharge norms as yet and when we see the inlet treatment as compared to the conventional outlet and this is our tedox treatment of the direct inlet which means we have bypassed bioremediation and you can see the change in micro pollutants the microbiology parameters and of course the waste uh, physical chemical was shown in last slide now when we compare our technology uh, with other decentralized so we propose is as a decentralized treatment technology and we compare with other uh, technologies in this sector we see in terms of efficiency you can see here it stand outs in terms of treatment time the time was this footprint you can see is very small power requirement is uh, comparable opex if you see and capex so capex is comparable but opex is 30 to 40% uh, reduced so these are and finally this is the concluding slide so when we see this technology implementation in the current demand side water management so definitely it is advanced promising clean and green on site so we can look forward to such technology implementations for on site treatment as micro stps water quality you can see it is adequate complete treatment pop removals footprint is small you can uh, um, we, we have done work for various uh, seven star hotels in malls where the second floor basement parking could be replaced with such a technology intervention and that space could be utilized for much beneficial purposes time of treatment is substantially reduced uh, definitely it's a resource efficient technology and then biological so even if you have seen there has been no biological and yet 90% bod reduction and disinfection is taking place along with other benefits and enhanced water use efficiency conventional technologies just provide water until 
up for horticulture but here we can uh, get treated water for point use applications and these are the increased point applications which are there and cost as i said opex is 30 to 40% reduced these are the recognition and awards for the technology and i acknowledge this technology has been developed dedox technology has been developed under dst water mission dst wti water technology initiative co-funded by ongc energy center and our industry partners are there who have provided us samples and thank you all for uh, your patient hearing thank you so much hello hello yes ma'am we can hear you acha so this is complete now so stop sharing yes sir so thank you all for uh, this presentation so now now seats seats are there so now sir i would request uh, rajiv ranjan mishra sir uh, to um, moderate the panel discussion Sukhpur ji, and uh, uh, now it's really my pleasure and privilege to uh, moderate the session uh, with all the eminent participants. Uh, we we really got a good overview of uh, demand side management, and then also we got an overview of little more of a technology tedox which uh, Nupur has just now shown. Uh, we 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 discussed in general some of the issues. So now this is time perhaps to really get the benefit of uh, panelists on different aspects of demand side management or supply side management and other issues. Uh, so I will uh, like to start with Professor Kalanithi Bairava Murthy and uh, Dr. Prabhu Sankar. Uh, I will be basically flagging a kind of issue. We have looked at uh, the benefits of demand side management. We also looked at some of the problems. So I would like uh, to get benefit of your ideas, like from a global perspective. Let, let, let's look at little more macro picture. And uh, what do you feel that, uh, what are the major challenges in implementing demand side water management strategies. So what comes to your mind as the kind of major challenges which we need to really address and then focus. So maybe I will start with Professor Vairava Murthy, request you to share your thoughts and then uh, also Dr. Prabhu Sankar. So let's start with Professor Vairava Murthy. Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and welcome from London. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be at this uh, very important uh, webinar and uh, iwa is very very happy to be uh, participating um to respond to your question in relation to uh, some of the challenges we see um in in relation to de demand management i think it's really perspective um you know i travel around the world and i visit many countries and there is still very much a culture among uh, certainly the technocrats that when there is a need for more water, the, the only solution is to look for the next river and, you know, even if it's far away, to try and think about how to pump that water towards the city and build, build some reservoirs and dams and supply it. But what we're seeing within the water sector is that there's now becoming a very interesting change in perspective where we're starting to look at the productive use of water. And uh, people are starting to now ask themselves, what is it that we want the water to do for us? And how can we match the quantity and the quality of the water for that intended use? And so there is this shift away from using drinking water for everything, but really trying to use multiple grades of water for different types of, of uses. And I think key to this is, is very much a systems perspective. And so if you, for example, look at the urban water cycle, and you say, I need some additional drinking water, for example, then you can choose from either, you know, extracting more surface or groundwater, or you could look at areas within your system where there are, where are opportunities to, to manage that drinking water. So, for example, leakage management. Leakage is very high quality water that is going to waste. And so, you know, would it be better for me to reduce my physical losses and free up this drinking water rather than extracting water from afar? Similarly, with, with, with demand management, we the same. And then people are starting to 
look at other waters within the system, things like grey water and black water, and trying to identify certain uses for those waters that could be could 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 you know would give a productive use of that. So, for example, grey water can be used for for flushing toilets and for some local gardening. Black water, with some treatment, can also be used for irrigation purposes. So, what we're seeing is a big push now in trying to reframe they want to use the water for and recognize that we you know not everything we do requires high quality drinking water and as a result of this see the deployment of, of reused water for some very interesting things so for example to uh, prevent groundwater to prevent uh, saline intrusion let's say because of over abstraction of groundwater people are using recycled or reused water uh, to inject groundwater uh, wells to create sort of seawater intrusion barriers. Um, you have innovation where they're taking the treated wastewater and developing solutions where you have a forward osmosis process which both treats the wastewater but also dilutes the seawater that reduces the cost of, of desalination. So from my perspective the biggest challenge um, is to change the mindsets of the practitioners and to get them to understand that you know different grades of water can be used for different purposes and all water is good water and to have these systems where they are looking at the water flows within the system and then trying to connect these different grades of water for different uses and if you do this then you can clearly reduce your overall water footprint the last thing that i want to say is that we've been doing a lot of work at iwa where we've looked at um, natural systems. People tend to think that if you want to do these, you need gray infrastructure. But actually, you can have a whole circular system using natural systems. So you can protect your water bodies with eco-hydrological, um, uh, you know, using vegetation that, that keeps your rivers cleaner. You can use river and lake bank filtration, which I know is used in India quite widely to treat the wastewater, to treat the drinking water. And then you can use things like constructed wetlands, stabilization ponds, and soil aquifer treatment to polish the wastewater before you reuse it. So if you have, um, you know, there is a potential to develop these very efficient processes uh, with a low energy footprint, although they might have a larger sort of physical footprint, uh, but they uh, tend to be much more resilient moving forward. So I think um, that would be my first uh, contribution. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Professor, you can you can check out. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, thank you for the opportunity once again to share my thoughts and share the experience, uh, Chennai experience with uh, the rest of the world. Uh, uh, Chennai, just to give the brief context uh, in which we operate, Chennai, as you all know, has been uh, has we received bad press last year for uh, the uh, for a historical drought. And uh, that has been the state of affairs uh, in Chennai uh, every second year. So it's a cyclical phenomenon in Chennai wherein uh, droughts are a regular feature here. And uh, Chennai has always had the supply-demand mismatch. Uh, traditionally, uh, Chennai has always had a lot of supplies and interventions and has almost tried everything possible under the sun. So we have had uh, a lot of things like we have had uh, water coming from uh, uh, distant reservoirs, interbasin river transfer has been tried. Uh, desalination, we are the first only city with two desal plants. Wastewater reuse, we are sort of pioneers. So we have tried everything under the sun and we are the first city to implement rainwater harvesting uh, with a lot of uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, but then uh, our approach has always been uh, to, on the supply side, like most cities uh, in the country. And uh, if you actually see why demand, uh, and in fact, in the recent years and uh, at the, in, in, currently, uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on demand side management uh, due to various factors. But then uh, let us also try to understand, at least from my perspective, the Chennai perspective, as to why demand side management has never been thought of. Maybe I'll just try to I put in, uh, I think I'll share the uh, point with, in the form of a slide. Uh, so I hope, so I, I think it's visible. So uh, I just try to put the uh, issues in the slide. So as uh, for a city like Chennai, which is sort of a representative of most cities, the supply demand mismatch comes with a lot of uh, issues. The supply is intermittent. 
you have parts of the city which get water supply for 2 hours every alternate day so that causes asset damage and has an impact on the water quality thereby so what happens is the consumers willingness to pay which is also dependent on the reliability of the supply they all take a beating and uh, for the cities like the indian cities are growing haphazardly and uh, uh, with particular reference to chennai Chennai, uh, from its original 176 square kilometer surface area, expanded to 426 square kilometer in 2011. So that is more than double. And uh, what we we took more than uh, close to 50 to 100 years to develop the water supply distribution network to the entire city. And in 10 years, we've been really trying to meet out the uh, supply uh, distribution network for the rest of the city, and that's been a real challenge. And uh, uh, ensuring the source of water supply for those areas has been the first priority and demand management has been a concurrent exercise. The, the most important, ex, uh, uh, which, which this might be very, very uh, specific to Chennai is the political economy which demand management comes with. And uh, we are a typical social welfare state where uh, the pricing of essential commodities uh, does not just, is not dependent on the market's, uh, market uh, uh, price. It's more the government has a huge role to play in fixing prices, especially of essential commodities. And uh, also the supply side intervention has a lot of glamorous big projects to show. So you build a dam, you build a desalination plant, you build a big uh, uh, a TTRO plant. They are all big, they are they, they're literally symbols of your achievements. And uh, while the supply demand side management doesn't have much things to show like this. And aging infrastructure is really an issue why demand management couldn't be mainstreamed in Chennai. Likewise, uh, having a parastatal body as a separate and not having uh, countries, country governments like the foreign countries, uh, they have more of uh, the city states, are, the cities are powerful. The mayor is a very powerful office, an institution. Uh, but uh, it is not exactly the case in a city like Chennai. And when you have two different multiple departments uh, where you need to work and there is not really a one government approach to things, things get very difficult. Technical issues also have been hampering the uh, uh, hampering uh, setting up demand management uh, in Chennai because uh, due to the intermittent supply, the metering has never been able to be uh, to, to be a success uh, even uh, when it has been attempted in the past. And lastly, uh, this is quite true, which uh, Professor Kalanidhi also touched: cultural issues. Uh, here, water is seen more as a right uh, in country and. Uh, uh, to really uh, change the thinking and uh, to change the behavior that water supply is actually a service which needs to be uh, sort of uh, compensated for is something which needs a lot of uh, uh, push and education uh, exercise to do. And uh, I believe these are the very few uh, reasons why uh, demand management hasn't really been successful. But then we now are at the cutting edge where we really need to uh, push in demand management and ensure efficient use of water. Uh, given that the supply side has actually hit a wall. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Uh, we had an excellent uh, opening with uh, Professor Vairavamurthy giving us a kind of more of a global perspective and certain common thread is there between him and then a more specific um, um, example of challenges in the context of Chennai, the cultural issues, the mindset plus linkage management, there are several things. Uh, I would like to actually request all the panelists because uh, we have to also be managing time. We have seven more questions after this and for each question I would be requesting two panelists. So uh, first question was good, a more general question and we also got a good detailed uh, remarks and uh, this thing from you. But uh, often you will get another chance to deliver, deliberate upon the similar issue. And you are very right. I mean, we, we, we now move on. We, we talked about Chennai being a kind of leader, initiated the rainwater harvesting program in a very big way, rooftop rainwater harvesting. Uh, now, the next uh, question is uh, to Dr. Um, uh, Sunita Pursottam and Professor Menon. Uh, we are going to deliberate now on what are the best practices. We, we looked at challenges. Now, let's look at some of the solutions, some of the best practices. Uh, water efficient technological interventions like we discussed earlier also low flow fixtures, rainwater harvesting, water meters, STPs, consumer behavior. So these some of these things came in our discussion of the challenges now. What are the best practices covering these issues, water efficient technological interventions, whether it's the kind of low fixtures, uh, rainwater harvesting, water meters, STPs, and consumer orientation for managing water demand in a smart cities. We, we all know, we look at a smart city and we, we want to be a kind of model for all these things. 
so what comes to your mind as a kind of best practices which which are happening which can actually lead others also to follow and improve uh, uh, meeting these challenges so may i request dr sunita prasottam ji to initiate the discussion on this and then we'll go to professor mohan sure thank you sir and it's a privilege to be here amongst all esteemed panelists uh, and all the delegates here today so uh, a few things come to my mind in terms of uh, best practices and how we should be looking at it it's both uh, during the construction phase as well as uh, use phase but the intervention actually starts in the design phase so it is at the design phase we'll have to be very sure that what are we designing for what kind of water security we should be providing for our uh, customers so that involves of course and definitely low flow fixtures and different technologies that we should be looking at uh, with respect to a reduction of demand uh, that's one aspect the use of uh, dual plumbing so that we can reuse the grey water recycled water so that needs to be accounted for and that should be a norm uh, for all new developments going forward uh definitely the sewage treatment plants and how do we uh, uh design and operate the sewage treatment plants and i'm very inspired with what uh, nupur uh, just showed and it looks like a very promising technology that should be scaled up uh for all new developments so these are some of the basic best practices uh, in the design phase of course what we also need to think of is the rain water harvesting not just the recharge pit construction and the sums but how do we integrate it into the landscape so that our development act as sponges and that would also mean how do we limit the use of concrete for covering up the entire ground so how much ground do we have do we use the trees in a particular manner so that we are able to rejuvenate the biodiversity so water and biodiversity and the wetland habitat sir you mentioned before how do we integrate into all the developments whether it is a industrial development commercial development or a residential development so we are into the business of uh, building cities also so how do we plan this so that it acts as spawn sponges and wetland habitat habitat so that biodiversity also is uh, enhanced so all of these have to be factored it in the design phase now in the construction phase best practices uh, definitely what we are now evaluating is curing compounds so that we can reduce the amount of water we use during the construction that is required for uh, curing of concrete and in the uh, in the construction phase can we also use uh, uh, reuse water okay so there are various uh, uh, requirements of water during the construction phase for settling of dust and so on so wherever the water quality is uh, of a high quality is not required can we use water for various purposes so these are some of the best practices that has has to be done across for all different types of developments uh, that's my uh, submission of uh, practical examples and what's very important uh, thing which comes to my mind is the intervention should start right at the design phase because if you think right at that stage then things will become easier later on uh, so professor mohan sir can you also share your thoughts on this i think uh, professor mohan your mic is uh, mute so unmute. you unmute it yeah yeah <laughs> uh thank you very much for giving an opportunity to add my view uh on the i look at first on the design stage i think 135 liters per capita per day is really very high for our country in fact we have been uh, the main problem is we make the huge infrastructure the pipeline is very high but water supply is low so it becomes a issue of uh, so uh, we know the reality is maybe around 60 100 so let us restructure our design itself so that there is no wastage of water because of the infrastructure we are just making uh, pushing lot of water to the thing without knowing what is the demand side so this is one of the major point that we have like to tell the second one i would like to borrow the demand side management i think the dublin principles are very important 
The Dublin principles, four principles which I would like to tell. The first principle is water is finite. So everyone should understand that even population may increase, urbanization may increase, but the water quantity is finite. And also we are going for water quality deterioration. So I think this principle, if we can, for any policy, uh, we should look at that for a city or a smart city, what is the total amount that it is available? With that, we may have to make a plan and allocation. Okay. Number two, if without any participatory approach, the water should not be handled. So the water will always be, especially the, uh, without the, uh, all people, the mind and then brainstorming, it is only one department making a decision. It doesn't work very well. And the third point is, the women play an important role in demand management. They may not play an important role on supply management, but demand management, I think the more important thing that the role of women. And the last one in the Dublin principle is water should be taken as an economic commodity rather than a free commodity. These four principles, if we are applying in the demand side, I think we should be, that should be the basic principle on which uh, we have to develop the policy and uh, system and so on. One more thing that I would like to look at on the operational side, I think this is a time that we have to go for decent places. We should not be go on looking at, uh, we need a lot of infrastructure, urbanization, apartments and so on, but each apartment should generate their own uh, kind of a treatment system or they have to recycle it. Because what they want is every time they are expecting that uh, government has to give the entire water to them. Instead of that, they can make a simple recycle. Okay, I'm not saying um, uh, uh, sewage treatment plan. They can make a simple natural treatment. There are many. This is our own, especially in India. The traditional treatment is from the kitchen water. It comes down, and there are some trees will take away all the BOD and other kind of thing and it goes to the well. So this cycle was within the house itself. Now we are making it, we are making the cycle all the way to travel for 100 kilometers and go to the treatment plant and look at the energy. It is not water also, we should not look at it. It is the energy that we have to compute out to the thing and again coming back. So instead of that, if we can go for decentralization, uh, then automatically the demand will come down. In fact, I, one of our studies says 70% of the water comes from grey water or what they use for bathroom and kitchen. If you can separate it with a double plumbing system or dual plumbing system, and that can be treated very simple. One is a sand filter, another is a uh, activated carbon filter and do some small uh, disinfection. Then that water can be reutilized. In fact, it can be of drinkable purpose, but uh, mindset may not allow us to drink. But at least for, especially on toilet flushing, and also we are doing for, in fact, IIT, we are doing the same thing. The entire campus, the toilet flushing is only reuse of water. So and the third point, which I would like to tell, uh, I think the mindset of the people always think that it's a waste water. I think we should change this perception. It is not a waste water, it is a used water. The used water is 99% pure and only 1% is a polluter. So if we can, the mindset changes, the moment the waste water, they wanted to waste it. But actually it is not a waste water. It is a used water which can be recycled without much kind of a effort on energy or for any big treatment system. So that is what first I would like to make it. This is my reaction on this system. Uh, later on, we'll come back. Thank you very much for that. So on, uh, for really laying down right from design, then also telling some basic principles and then also suggesting that certain policy level things need to be done. And grey water is an area which is very important area which you also raised. Uh, now it's time to actually look at the policy level intervention and ask uh, the two of the panelists, Dr. Prabhu Sankar and Mr. Rajneesh Chopra. 
uh, how can government regulation and policy level interventions will uh, how can they help in managing water demand in indian cities so look at the discussion so far and then we are anyway we have got a kind of foundation to go into the policy and regulations so i think in your opinion how these government regulations or policy interventions can help us in managing water demand in uh, cities so we start with uh, prabhu sankar uh, sir, <clears throat> certainly sir thank you sir uh, sir in my opinion uh, having worked here in the sector for uh, close to 3 years uh, i would just would like to state that government regulations and policy level interventions are certainly necessary but not sufficient uh, if at all we are planning to uh, mainstream demand management in our uh, scheme of things Uh, so, as rightly pointed, uh, in fact, the the presentation which literally started the uh, the entire session had five uh, components uh, for a successful demand management program, and uh, the only it was just one of the five. Uh, and uh, the real problem with our uh, demand intervention side intervention program. So let let me just cite example from the own Chennai's attempts at demand management. Uh, Chennai has always tried to do something about demand management, but they have always been. limited to technical side interventions so it has always been piecemeal uh, so what we have replaced there was a second chennai project which happened in the year around 1996 with world bank funding wherein we replaced uh, close to 100 kilometers of uh, uh, pipeline uh, we had some storage uh, uh, structure reinforcement uh, we had some hydraulic reinforcement all those things were done but then uh, what happens it was not backed by a sound policy and uh, sometimes we have a sound policy but it is not backed by technical interventions nor a uh, engagement with the public uh, in uh, what uh, no manner whatsoever so uh, we really need to uh, do it in a concerted manner uh, and do everything and i would rather say uh, we really need to uh, do education more uh, educating the public towards water conservation bring them to a plane where they will be receptive to the idea of demand management and then uh, regulation should happen so uh, as i said the point is it is certainly necessary but absolutely insufficient yeah. thank you thank you so much i think that's a very i mean you have learned from your experience and that's true also policies can play a role but there are certain limitations so it's very good you told about policy backed by action i mean the right kind of action so now mr chopra rajnish ji what's what's your thought on this you have been in industry you have seen lots of government policies lots of interventions guidelines in your experience how they have really helped okay so first thank you for this opportunity now uh starting about the policies i think uh one thing i should compliment the government there are a lot of policies and of late what i have seen is the policies you know rather than a stick you know even a carrot is being used by the government now i have often said in lot of forums i may be repeating again the question is we have very very progressive policies from the government but probably at the federal government level they are from different ministries so an organization like nmcg which is today talking about you know a new policy on the wastewater management probably that can help in integrating all these policies like one uh, policy is from you know urban affairs which talks about you know if i convert the sludge in the cv treatment plant to manure i can claim a subsidy right even if i distribute free to the farmers i can claim a subsidy so that is something which is a revenue model at the same time it helps the urban areas to save lot of landfill areas today in fact in you know cities like mumbai and delhi when the tenders are coming it's very clearly mentioned that we will not be able to give you any land for the landfill if the sludge has to be disposed similarly when we talk about the other uh, you know components of a cv treatment plant today mnre if i set up a you know gas uh, engine or you know i generate energy today i can claim up to you know 2 crore rupees per megawatt as a subsidy but all these things i believe should be factored in into a every project there is a third policy i'm sure you uh, tied up on it also from the power sector we talks about recycle of and reuse of treated water if it is within 50 km radius of an stp now all these you know policies which are very very progressive if you know they can be factored in i think uh, 
we i don't foresee that you know the policies are in two things one definitely integration second is you know implementation how fast we can implement and for that although uh, you are you know chairing the session so but uh, one thing is you know what nmcg has done today i am in touch with some of the states where they are talking about a similar model to attract private investment and which can you know fast forward the whole process of implementation so i don't foresee any reason and as far as you know having listened to all the experts here i don't feel that we are, there is any problem as far as water is concerned there is enough of water i think if you know we spoke about the you know, non renewable water now if you know i think uh, we are losing some forty by seven can be mandated and implemented in all urban areas so you see there is some connectivity issue so we are not able to hear and open local bodies which is one of mohan also mentioned about you know then it not a this sir kindly uh, of your video so that you get proper bandwidth yeah yeah i think some connectivity is there yes sir oh uh, sir he disconnected okay i think uh, we got the essence of it and maybe he he will be joining there will be another question i, I think what mr rajnish told is very right telling about integration of policies because often different sector different ministries come up with the policy or some guidelines on the similar kind of subject so that integration is essential at government of india level also and even at the state level also so that's very imp implementation is again another important thing i can just share with you like you mentioned about the power ministry coming up with the tariff guidelines in 2016 that's basically about reuse of uh, treated waste water from stp located within 50 kilometers now we are continuously working with the power ministry looking at stp trying to map them like there the power plant and our stp is not only namami ganga all the stp is state by state there are lots of issues lots of implementation issues come up so i think that policy when we frame that policy we have to look at these things the distance if it exceeds by some small kilometer who will pay for what component so lot of now with that interaction actually when we are trying to implement lot of clarity is coming lot of problems we are now trying to sort out and take some view on that so actually it's a kind of continuous process look at a good integrated policy but ultimately in implementation you will learn some things and perhaps it has to be brought back to the policy and you have to do some sort of revision or some tweaking so that's a very uh, very interesting area where uh, you two will have indicated uh, the next question is actually more on the real estate sector and to some extent uh, uh, dr sunita ji and professor mohan also addressed it uh, we all know the value of real estate it's actually contributing and then in the gdp from 5 to 6% in 2008 the credi estimates that by 2020 now actually it should be around 11% so basically that's the, the the real estate sector is very important sector for the economy for employment we all know about that uh, and that's why how this real estate sector estate sector can lead these kind of conservation efforts for environmental sustainability whether it is water in case of water little bit discussion we ha already had water energy or waste management and how can developers actually contribute and ensure sustainable use of water in the buildings so to some extent you have answered this question to flag but if any new idea any other yeah. thing was more looked at real estate sector and contribution to the sustainability of water waste and energy so is so, that is that yes thank you sir so uh, definitely what we need to uh, do is to uh, have the economic cost of water known to the customers so that's very important water comes uh, we pay peanuts for water there is a cost associated with treating pumping uh, you know uh, the wastewater treatment all of the, that is actually not communicated in as many terms to the user end user so if we are able to put a uh, you know a smart meter 
and ensure that uh, every customer understands that they are being billed as per their usage, then the behavioral aspect can be enhanced and people can then start taking action. So it's very important to have smart meters in place where the customer actually starts uh, understanding what is the usage and what are you getting billed for. So this transition from analog to digital meters with at uh, metering uh, on a regular basis, it's like live. Uh, it's a live dashboard that comes to you. Uh, is something that needs to be uh, taken up very seriously, and that can result in thirty percent reduction in uh, in the demand straight off, and that will be year on year. So once you implement that system, uh, in fact, most of the vendors that we are engaging with say that it's twenty five to thirty percent flat. Uh, reduction in the demand. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is what is the uh, customer awareness and how do you engage with the customers on uh, creating this sensitization around water? So whether it is your CSR program and you create that customer awareness by engaging with children uh, of the residents because they are the next generation, uh, they are able to drive that behavior change within their homes as well. So that's another aspect that we uh, definitely are, uh, you know, we have uh, done several sessions with our various customers. The other perspective is not just the builder customer relationship. The RWA then plays a major role. So uh, the Resident Welfare Association and the management committee, uh, especially in Pune, Bangalore region, have actively started looking for these solutions. So even if the builder doesn't do it, it's the RWAs that are that are you know bringing such solutions and sensitizations in. So the role of the builder definitely is there in providing uh, metering. What you what you can't what you have I mean what you don't measure you can't manage. So water measurement and the economic value in terms of total cost of water, right from treatment to uh, making it available at your uh, house. That entire link has to be brought in front of the customer. Then uh, the things become easier. So I think a little bit of technology help and the human inter intervention around sensitization uh, will go a long way. And that uh, uh, Tarishi also mentioned when she was going through the uh, report because a lot of these audit uh, have happened in vendor life spaces probably. So the sensitization part, both digitally as well as uh, through interventions, training programs, definitely goes along with So thank you. I think you have really hit upon the technological interventions and more how to engage children. I, I think children and students, we have also seen from our experience, if you can really come up with a program and they get convinced, they actually they, they, they carry it forward to their family and even parents. So far, Mission also we saw it in Ganga Mission also we are seeing it. And RWAs and developers working together for this will really be very, very useful. Uh, Professor uh, Bohan, sir, can you just uh, uh, right. give your points briefly upon the how real estate developers can contribute to the sustainability at different stages uh, of okay. their projects or in any other manner? Uh, thank you. But uh, I happen to be the last two years uh, chairman for state expert appraisal committees where all the uh, builders, everybody comes for getting the environmental clearance. So in that, we insist two or three points, which may be uh, taken up in all the other states. Number one, which we say that, uh, as I mentioned, dual plumbing is compulsory within, if it is in the city. So it is, uh, they have to go for a dual plumbing for that. It, and second one, is zero waste uh, unit so that the waste should not be put down to the outside. The waste is a menace. The waste only pollutes a lot on the water bodies. So that I think if we can control the we, we really control the industry, but we are not controlling the local municipality and everything on the solid waste. I think if the solid waste can be zero waste from any apartment, any house. I think that will be the best way to protect the water. So automatically, the if you want demand or supply, whatever it is, that will be really helpful. The second one, which I found that they are born using groundwater for construction. If you look at it, many of the builders, 
they use only ground water but what we are suggesting is i think uh, prabhu sangar is also there the treated water what it is there uh, from the city is water treatment that can be sold and then to the these people we are they need not i then try to give them with a particular cost i think that will solve because many time that we are pumping lot of ground water because it is out of sight we are also uh, it is becomes out of thinking but ground water is a one like a money in the bank whenever i have a drought i depend upon the ground water i think the ground water we should be protecting if you want a demand management yeah that will be the savior for if uh, if i don't have water on that well or rainfall is failing ground water will come in so i think whenever we have uh, the waste water treated water uh, i don't call it as a waste of water but treated water can be utilized for construction and we should have a, a rule for it if i don't have a rule nobody will follow that so i think this is one thing that we may have to make it very clear and we are also insisting that every construction should be at least minimum 10 to Twenty uh, percent solar energy should be next, so that you know the normal energy side. I think they there will be a real reduction, so that you know there is no problem as such. And also they have to take a corporate environmental responsibility in that whatever nearby water bodies they have to uh, set right back. This also we are saying because uh, if you look at every apartment uh, builders. You know, I come across minimum two hundred crore, but if I want to re- revive the water body, it may be maximum. It may take around one crore. So, if every construction uh, person can take up a adapt a nearby water body and then uh, set right, I think we can solve many problems. As you said, once the water body nearby is good, people also can enjoy. So that's the way that we have to look at in a holistic. Rather than as an individual, otherwise the groundwater will be going up, especially in the urban areas. That's my point of view on this. Thank you, thank you, Professor. I think you really has summarized almost all issues. Groundwater is really important. So use of treated wastewater for construction, solar energy, utilizing that in the construction uh, in in these um, um, buildings. and uh, what's perhaps very important which i also had mentioned in the beginning the water bodies the nearby water bodies actually if they can be taken over or some sort of adoption kind of thing is there it will help everyone environment locality and lot of goodwill will also come among the uh, among the residents and even the other citizens who are not part of your township so i think csr could be a very good source and focus and priority on water sector can be really very good uh now see we are still left with four questions and uh, we we really do not have so much of time but now there are two uh, some issues on supply side we talked quite a lot and covered so many items on the demand side management so my next question again i will request uh, dr prabhu sankar and professor vairava murthy to very quickly summarize the limitations of supply side of water management i mean we already had some deliberation on that but quick points on limitations of supply side management uh, can be start with professor murthy yes sir and then we'll come to prabhu sankar Oops. you want to start with me uh, mr ranj yeah so um yeah in relation to supply side um the, of course you know with with global change and growing population the supply demand deficit is very clear and really the challenge for us as a as as a sector is to really decouple a little bit the economic growth because there's a strong correlation between resource extraction and and economic growth we have to learn how to decouple that what what i find is problematic in terms of the supply side management is uh, institutional fragmentation um when we look at a watershed we have of course water for agriculture water for the city water for industry but also water for nature and actually we are optimizing these systems in um in a silo fashion right you know in isolation so there's a lot of work on optimizing water flows within the urban context there's a lot of work on optimizing water within the agricultural sector and of course there's been a lot of innovation in the area of industrial like uh, ecology 
where we optimize the use of resources within, um, within industry. But there are lots of synergies between these sectors. And because of institutional fragmentation, we're not able to recognize some of these opportunities. If you take a country like India, for me, uh, the, the urban or the city and, 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 the agri and the ag sector, they almost have to be like brothers and sisters, right? Because the synergies are so strong. So when you look at wastewater reuse, agricultural sector is, is a very, very potential uh, recipient of that treated wastewater. Um, and as a result of the utilization of, of that reused water, the agricultural sector can start to implement um, efficiencies, which then benefit the, the urban sector. And similarly, the way in which agriculture manages its, its efficiencies could have, in some cases, a negative impact potentially on, on ecosystem services because of the recharge potential diminishes. So this understanding of the interactions between these different sectors is missing. And, and very much it's missing because of the institutional fragmentation. These sectors aren't talking at all. So for me, if we are to move forward, and if we are to try and get, you know, um, if we are trying to do as much as we can with as much as possible, um, we need to understand the interactions between these sectors, how transfer benefits occur between these sectors. And that is really missing um, at the moment. So I would encourage uh, with the work that you are all doing to try and get the actors from these different sectors to work together because that's where the solution is. I mean, you know, in my previous job at, at the International Water Management Institute, we found that in the urban-rural interface, there were huge synergies that took place, um, both in terms of the use of reused water, but also the co-digestion co of agro-industrial waste with municipal waste you know, for energy production. There were so many opportunities for interactions, but what was always limiting was the institutional fragmentation. Thank you. I think uh, you have really hit the fundamental thing, the institutional fragmentation, and then how we can really synergize different sectors. And you also gave good example of treated wastewater and agriculture. So if we actually start looking deeper into that, there could be several possibility of finding solutions, identifying the limitations and finding solutions also. So uh, Dr. Prabhu Sankar, what comes to your mind on this side? You have been a practitioner. You have been actually looking at sector closely. So, here are some of your ideas. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, so, once again, I would like to show a small slide which actually tells you the limitations of the supply side. Uh, I hope it's possible. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. So, as you can see, uh, I think these are quite obvious. In the Chennai experience, we can always see that conventional water resources are finite. The demand curve is always going up. But then the water resources, at least the conventional water resources, let's say which are rainfall dependent, the uh, reservoirs, the rivers, they are all finite and uh, they have huge political considerations. For example, we have a long standing water sharing problem with the neighboring states, uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, and uh, they, it's, it's finite. You hit a wall and uh, they all come at huge capex costs to bring the water from interbasin river transfer or construction of reservoir. They all come with huge capex costs. So, and uh, in this era, these are getting uh, difficult uh, with every passing day. If we go for unconventional water resources where we have already tied our hand in, like let's say desalination or wastewater reuse, setting up TTRO plants, they are wonderful. They are absolutely uh, not dependent upon external factors for their sustainability, but then they come with a huge OPEX cost in addition to the CAPEX cost. So, that is something which is unsustainable for any water utility like, like us. And uh, like these, these big projects, supply side, the interventions are big projects uh, which have their huge environmental impact. The diesel plant is one classic example. The discharge of rain, uh, in spite of numerous environmental safeguards, has always has, has its fair share of impact. And so is social impact. So uh, laying pipelines, you need to acquire a lot of land, displacing uh, huge, uh, large, large populations. So they all come with uh, huge social and environmental impacts. And lastly, sustainability. Uh, we, we, these cannot, all these sources, especially the reliance and the exploitation of groundwater are absolutely unsustainable. And uh, you literally are pouring water into a, a, a leaking pot. So once the, it is high time, we fix the pot and just not uh, uh, rush uh, a huge gush of water into the leaking pot. So it is high time. And these, in my view, are the limitations of the supply side. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. I think you gave very 
clear examples and the constraints which you have faced it. Uh, we, we have discussed it from the government's perspective, from national state and all that. So the next question, uh, the next issue which we will deliberate is more on the urban local bodies, you will be point of view. And again, I think uh, the Professor S. Mohan, I will request you and uh, Mr. Prabhu Sankar to address this issue. Uh, there are several challenges faced by ULBs when they try to expand their service network. Some of it, I think uh, Prabhu Sankar has explained uh, already, water supply infrastructure uh, and keeping pace with the population. I think we also had that uh, particular uh, challenge in our mission also. Uh, the urbanization is growing, population is growing, and your supply does not increase, your infrastructure does not really keep pace with that, especially at the ULB level. So at that point of time, do you think that some retrofitting and upgradation of the old assets, old defunct network or leaky distribution system, to what extent that will be able to help us? Or should we only go for the new infrastructure? We know the constraints and we know the pace at which uh, we are urbanizing. So Professor Mohan, what comes to your mind? To what yeah. extent to look at the older infrastructure and rehabilitate them? I mean, the kind of combination, how we go about and then after that, I will request Prabhu Sankar to share some of his actual experiences on this. So, Professor yes, Mohan, sir. sir. Yeah. I, first of all, uh, like to put the point, there is always we are extending the water distribution network or waste network, which itself is wrong. The uh, water network or water distribution network has been designed for certain population or certain pipeline diameter have been arrived at it. If I am connecting at one point, then automatically somebody else will be getting uh, affected as well. What I would say is, whatever the water distribution system or collection system, the collection system, whatever it has been designed, only in that area that it has to serve. The remaining area, we have to look at alternatives. Alternatives, I would like to say, one is the natural way of treatment. So that I think we have, uh, we are not going into it like a constructed wetland. You can just create a small uh, thing in your uh, urban local bodies and like uh, constructed wetland or some kind of a pond or maybe a, uh, there are many good uh, treatment. You just pass through some filter, uh, sand filter and then uh, automatically it will be cleaned up. There is no need for uh, changing the infrastructure too much and then spending a lot of time because the design is uh, technically, if you ask me, uh, it has been designed for a particular purpose, particular people, particular demand. So if I go on add the pipeline in, into it, somewhere the pressure will be a problem and somebody will get more water. I think this point needs to be looked into it in the ULB. They have to come out with uh, very urban or whatever it is on that. They have to come with their own way of treatment of treatment or water supply. Please don't try to connect with the existing system and then try to say that the system is not working well. I think that will be the first point what I would like to say that that's uh, really. The second one, again, uh, I'm coming back to the same thing. The, we are on reducing the uh, wetland. On the other hand, the wetlands have been taken as a solid waste dumping site. Actually, wetland is really a good thing to absorb all the pollutant and make it as a treated water on its own. It's like an oxidation pond, which will treat it. But now we are putting too much of solid waste onto the wetland, and the wetland is coming down. So if it is possible, the urban area, local bodies, they can create some kind of a good wetlands, which can be... Uh, especially on coast, most of the cities are in coastal side, those cities can create a good wetland and then try to look at on that because we are not looking at it. Uh, I always look at sustainability in three angles. One is uh, sustainable development in three angles. One is sustainability, which all of you know that we have to retain the system for the future thing. The second is survivability. Whatever the system that it has to survive uh, what purpose that it was designed or what purpose it is created, that it has to serve. The moment that it is not serving, the survival is questioned. But the third one is efficiency. So these three things 
for whether it's a water supply system or sewage treatment system, if we look at on these three angles, I think we will be able to uh, do that. And my only uh, simple request uh, thing is, we should not be beyond extending the pipeline to that, then that, that's a really a wrong thing that what we are doing. That's what my uh, point to. Uh, excellent advice because uh, what you are saying, we also see often when we are looking at the projects which come because in a very mechanical way, we only try to extend pipeline or do one type of solution without looking at various other options. And again, something very important he has said about the wetlands. Wetlands are actually natural way of treating waste and East Kolkata wetland, we all know how much they really help the city in the treatment of the sewage of the city. I mean, they have been doing it since ages. So I think we have to look at those options as well and then go for it. So, uh, Prabhu Sankar, uh, quick thoughts on this uh, and your experience. Certainly, sir. Uh, I'll just fit my uh, uh, response into two parts. So the first part pertaining to the expansion of network, as uh, Professor Mohan rightly pointed out, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mystery how uh, projects were conceived, even in Chennai, without even working on the source for the project. For example, there's a lake, Samarampakam Lake in Chennai. Every water supply project which was taken up uh, uh, in the last decade had Samarampakam Lake as a source. When And Samarampakam Lake is notorious that it gets filled once in four years. And this is the lucky year, 2020, at least uh, uh, in the water supply aspect for Chennai, where we have a full Samarampakam Lake. So this was, as he rightly said, expansion happens without any securing what would be the source. And uh, secondly, uh, expansion of network is certainly difficult because the resources are hard to come by. It's not the same scenario like earlier. And land availability is a real issue. We really cannot execute projects uh, like the way we used to. And execution is difficult because the pipelines are replacing a pipeline. Even if I get the funds, it's difficult on a very busy stretch of road. And uh, you really cannot change the pipeline. Uh, you really have to lay an alternate pipeline somewhere in the site. So things are actually very difficult in an operation and execution aspect also. And even when you think of decentralization, like Professor Mohan su uh, su suggested, uh, going uh, to a complete shift from the traditional centralized way of, uh, let's say, water supply distribution or sewage treatment actually is a challenge because there have been huge infrastructural investments which have been made in the system. And it is a, it is a, it is a, it's a pity that we really cannot completely abandon the existing system, but certainly there's a strong case for supplementing the existing centralized systems with these decentralized systems. For example, we are actually doing a decentralized water supply system in Chennai. Likewise, even the wastewater reuse is sort of trying to be decentralized in pockets. Uh, lastly, uh, we also have a, a live example of retrofitting of old uh, sewage treatment plants. It's the first of the thing happening in the country, wherein we are trying to retrofit all the old ASP-based uh, sewage treatment plants uh, to adhere to the recent CPCB norms of BOD TSS of 10, 10 each. And uh, we are really trying out innovative solutions, uh, uh, trying MBBR in some uh, STPs, uh, converting the basins into MBBR basins, or trying uh, uh, some more uh, nutrient removal systems. So that's that's actually we believe that will really uh, have its uh, uh, premium. Uh, lastly, the, the the overall point is that asset management has never been a forte of the Indian uh, public utilities, and uh, that is something that should be a focus area in the days to come if we really need to have a sustainable future. Uh, excellent. Uh, I think uh, the examples which you gave, uh, we simply extend and then that kind of asset management has never, I mean, the long term thinking and asset management has never been given the due importance. But as you said, you are retrofitting. We also tried to retrofit some of the old STPs constructed under Ganga Action Plan. Not everywhere you will be successful, but STP is retrofitting is still possible. But as you rightly say, for the old sewer lines, it's very difficult. One, another problem, what happens, people do not even have the data. They do not have a map where exactly it lies. I mean, that institutional memory also is lacking often in various cities in the, at ULB level. So that's another uh, constant which uh, we all share. Um, Quick uh, look at wastewater management. We already discussed, so I will request Mr. Rajneesh Chopra and Sunita ji. Uh, we'll start with Rajneesh. 
how can waste water treatment plants help in reducing the fresh water demand so i think we have deliberated about reuse and how can this thing are there any promising sustainable technologies so more you tell us from the technology how exactly uh, this can help certainly we have discussed about reuse of the treated uh, waste water and to reduce the fresh demand i told in the beginning about mathura project so we have several examples so what are the sustainable technology how we really we can really do it more and more more often rajnish ji yeah see as far as technologies are concerned i think uh, even just now dr prabhu shankar mentioned about it so we have the latest technologies whatever is required to treat the water the question is you know the maximum recovery we can get in terms of recycle and reuse that's one part of it and secondly the use of this water the treated water i think one more thing what i can suggest is that today i see in some of our sewage treatment plants the water is getting treated to even new cpcb norms like one plant is there in delhi where it is achieving all the new cpcb norms now that is very clean water there is hasn't been observation from ngt also or you know that why this kind of the delhi uh, jal board is trying their level best we are every day you know sending tankers and tankers for horticulture for construction activity but the quantum of water in this particular plant it's around 20 million gallons per day now one more thing what we can you know explore is that you know in major cities ground water has been depleting definitely rainwater harvesting is the first thing we have to resort to but can we inject this water directly into the ground water what we call as asr so if we can implement that and recharge the ground water so that on a whenever you know like we keep on talking since i am also based out of chennai so we keep talking about you know day zero in chennai you know it's very often not only here in india i hear it in every part of the world when i go although we are getting water without any problem at our houses but maybe you know media sometimes the way they write so i think that's something we can definitely explore we can you know it's already being treated to a new cpc we now so before it is injected we can have another round of filtration and uh, you know disinfection before we inject it back i think that can help us you know revive our you know natural storage and this storage will be much better than you know the uh, civil structures which we create for storage the cost will be also not that high and it is definitely there is no you know evaporation losses in the process the other part is i think tamil nadu uh, dr prabhu shankar will bear me out i think we were talking about when we are you know using all this and we are going to treat it to new cp cb standards supposing there is no immediate use of this water can we create a grid for the waste water which runs through the industrial areas and the agricultural belts right where this water can be tapped and but people are clearly you know knowing that what is the quality of the water in that if industry is tapping they further do the tertiary treatment and if it can be as per the agricultural demand standards these are the two things i think where waste water which is already getting treated and discharged and not being adequately utilized can help us you know reduce the overall water demand in any urban area that's all from my side thank you okay thank you i think interesting ideas and uh, perhaps we need to work the details of this thing whether it's the injecting rain water to ground and then also grid for waste water i think certainly when we plan industrial area the estates are planned this is looks quite feasible to if we we as many of you said at the design stage if we think perhaps lot of yeah. things can be possible so that that would be really useful uh, sunita ji your thoughts on this yeah so um, i'm audible right Yes, yes, yeah. you are able to do it. Yeah. So uh, it's again a design stage intervention, uh, which we should look at very seriously. Uh, one is that we are mixing the grey water uh, with uh, the sewage water, and then we are sizing the STP. We must not do that, uh, and we must keep the grey water, like Professor Mohan said, separate. And because the treatment cost associated with that is through simple filtration. and that can be go uh, that can go back into gardens or into river bodies and as uh, mr ratnish chopra suggested you know it can be also uh, used for recharging uh, after simple treatment so that 
Uh, and then the sizing of the STP for uh, managing the water from residential apartments becomes much lower, and the energy O and M, all the costs associated will come down. Now, if you don't want to look at a STP, the technology could also be biogas out of that. So it's a waste to energy, which could have a uh, you know. So it's basically like a sulab sachale concept where you are able to harness the biogas out of the sewage. so it's so we can actually stop thinking about treating the uh, waste as a waste so the the point is the more we talk about it as waste uh, and not as a resource we are actually saying okay we can do away with it and we bring in large systems which cost a lot of capex and we stop thinking about the alternatives so alternatives at the design stage with scalable technologies that can also consider waste to energy uh, for lighting uh so basically you need to have your pipe separately uh convert it into energy that's option 1 and uh, then you have all the gray water gray water is not dirty so gray water is can be used for gardening for re, uh, you know using it in recharge for recharging the ground water and so on it can be reused back again in in your homes also after a simple treatment so that i think we need to bring in in a very big way so even when we do a certification so uh, whether it is a griha or igbc we should start looking at uh, you know not about the size of the stp and the water demand in that light uh, in fact the sizing of stp should reduce only to cater to uh, the uh, sewage water and keep the gray water separate so that's an idea that can possibly help the technology is there there are a lot of people who are working in this area uh scaling would be required yeah yeah actually this is good because often we also hear sometimes a very large capacity stp is created and sometimes rain water storm water part of it is also added in the flow and then the stp is designed i mean we have yes. come across and there is lot of lot of possibility of really doing something which is actually required uh the the the, the last question is also very much related about existing waste water treatment systems uh how we we can really adopt or change them or modify them to help us in the demand side management of the cities and uh, uh rajneesh ji has actually he is there in this also actually i should have asked him this both the questions together that would have saved time but rajneesh ji but you can give some brief ideas and then in the end we will come back to professor verba burti about uh, his his views and his experience on that so, so rajneesh ji uh, sure uh, i think uh, what you just mentioned uh, mr saab i think uh, this is very much a doable thing i think uh, dr prabhu shankar also mentioned that we have some existing stps they need to be there are two things one it needs to be renovated to the new cpcb norms secondly by intervention of the new technologies like mbr mbbr using the same civil structures we can enhance the capacity of the treatment which is required right so rather than building further capacities we can enhance those capacities ranging from 15% to 25% using the same structures but it would vary from plant to plant it cannot be generalized and also you know existing plants they are very old plants where you know bod is uh, 30 and tsss is you know 50 then there are plants which have been built in last few years where it is 20 bod and 30 tsss so probably with the new norms and you know with nitrogen and phosphorus and e coli also into it it would required you know a tertiary treatment and the moment we do the tertiary treatment obviously this water in my individual opinion it cannot be wasted it has to be reused so there are n number of technologies available we are already implementing for newer uh, uh, plants we are talking about technologies like nereda which will actually reduce the total footprint and the civil cost of the plant so that is something which uh, one of the projects we are implementing in the ganga also in bihar which is using this technology so there are in so many technologies which we already have and going forward uh, maybe it is little futuristic to talk about but i think uh, dr nupur is here you know i think uh, she has been talking about micro pollutants so that is some one thing you know the first country to do that removal of micro pollutants as in the world has been switzerland and we have successfully 
commissioned four plants there and maybe you know when we are looking at some, you know such stringent you know treatment norms uh, coming from cpcb probably which is more than what we treat in europe i think this is one time probably even if we can you know have a further policy intervention of you know removal of micro pollutants also to be incorporated into it because the outlay for the water and uh, sanitation sector what we see from the government currently something uh, at least we have not seen this ever in the independent india so one is definitely with jal shakti the integration of all the water under one ministry and secondly is you know the outlay of the budget it's huge so probably this could be another thing where india could you know be progressive in you know implementing along with some of the developed nations if we are going to treat the wastewater to new cpcb norms thank you i think uh, you have rightly hit we are perhaps uh, aiming for a very stringent norm and then um, working integration is taking place uh, a kind of good outlay is also being given and not only by government of india thanks to ngt directions various states we are seeing we review every month uh, so many of the states we were who were absolutely not uh, putting stps or waste treatment in their priority they are now looking at it and then some of them are actually not only due to force of uh, ngt direction they are actually getting into it and then trying to find solution and sometimes cost effective solution some of them now because of this they are looking at our hybrid energy model also because they don't have to pay immediately so much of money so i think that kind of change is uh, taking place uh, on this positive note i will request professor verva murthy to share his thoughts and have the last word yeah professor. thank thank you very much um I think uh, you know it's important to learn lessons, right? I mean, I think you mentioned in your opening introduction that 50 to 60 percent of the SDPs are not not working in in India, and we've also done quite a lot of research where we get similar sort of results in in many African countries, where you know a lot of investment has been incurred to build these systems, and um, they very quickly become dysfunctional. and um and and also coupled with that the fact that you know in most cities the 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 percentage of the community that are served by sewers is also very very limited now there is an opportunity i think for india particularly you know to try and leapfrog and to do things very differently and not try to sort of tinker with some of this old technology that that they have um you know embraced in the past i mean the next 20 years is really going to be the golden age for wastewater definitely and you will see a lot of investments in india in this respect but there are many innovations that are allowing um the the systems to be much smaller in terms of their footprint much greater energy savings um they have much better improved capex and opex um uh, factors associated with them and of course improved effluent quality so you have technologies like granular sludge anamox uh, thermal hydrolysis and then i think with advanced control um you know very much in terms of digital control you can manage much more the physics of of these flows in a more efficient way i think moving forward one of the things that you need to recognize in many of the cities in india is that you know the percentage of people who are actually touched by sewers is limited and instead i think prabhu shankar was saying about the extending uh, your infrastructure you know i mean many, very often the, the core of the infrastructure may have even been laid by the colonialists right and what we've done is we've just extended 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 and we end up with a spaghetti type system and um the both the water distribution network and the sewers are not very functional i think there is an opportunity to think differently to ring fence if you like the central core and then look in a very different way at the emerging urban areas around the city and try and create much more decentralized systems you know water is very heavy and if you try to move water a long distance then treat it and then bring it back to the city which is you know how you reduce the overall water footprint and 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 how you promote reuse it's very energy intensive So if you start looking at decentralized options where you move, you try to minimize the distance that you're moving water because it is very heavy I think you can start to do fairly innovative things so my 
advice is to sort of not try and extend your existing uh, large centralized infrastructure, but try and create sort of autonomous units around the city where you have decentralized systems. And then try to use, you know, as was mentioned by Rajanish, uh, try and utilize some of the innovation that exists within the sector so that you can um, both recover energy, but also reuse that water. I think that's really, you know, the way forward, okay? A decentralized approach. And the research that's been done by IWA, uh, these decentralized units have to be as small as possible, but as large as they need to be, because they have to be professionally managed. And we're finding uh, these decentralized units that can serve populations of around 30 to 50,000 uh, is a very good scale size, right? So if you have a cluster of these decentralized units and, and, and it also allows you to stage your development, okay? And as urban areas grow, instead of anticipating that growth and building a big backbone, which often fails, you can actually follow that growth and map it and, and incrementally grow your wastewater provision. So that would be my final word. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think you really uh, brought into picture and then that should be the lesson. I mean, throughout our discussion, people have been talking about designing the system, planning properly, having a good mix, convergence, uh, policy making in an integrated way. So, uh, and you are right. The, we have to look at urbanization process, look at the core of the city, look at the peri-urban areas and even some of the rural areas which are going to become urban very soon. And then uh, looking at all of them, we have to have a good mix of centralized, decentralized. And what we are doing uh, when we started, lots of old STPs, 40-50% we could again rehabilitate, but again the challenge is to retrofit to the new standards. So I think this is a continuous process. Uh, whatever new STPs we are doing, and um, Tamil Nadu is uh, doing quite well in that, we are also trying to use the unutilized capacity for septage management by co-treatment. So I think that could be, I think Tamil Nadu is doing a lot of projects and most of our Namavaganga new projects actually we have uh, put that as a kind of provision so that there is a kind of uh, receiving center. So that could be another very good way of looking at so that at least environment is protected, that septage does not get into the water body. So uh, and we are trying to keep a kind of target in next one year, trying to look at the unutilized capacity of the STPs in a very, very systematic way to analyze those STPs. Otherwise, it can create some harm also. So with all those things, that could be another way of looking at uh, improving our sanitation. I think we have really very badly exceeded the time given. and uh, uh, But we had really excellent, um, good conversation. So I now hand over back to Sanjay Sajji. Thanking I, all of you. Can I just make one point before I you close? It? Yes, yes. Yeah, sir. I think uh, he was making a point that uh, the treated water can be pushed into groundwater. I am. I am not pessimistic, but I am not also optimistic because sometimes, unless we have the standards for injecting the water, please don't suggest these particular things because. Once a groundwater is getting polluted, cleaning up is very, very difficult. It is not at all possible. If even one person, if he does it wrongly, the entire groundwater will be getting up. So that will be the last resort. On the other hand, rainwater harvesting, even if you put and then push it inside, that will be more water is available. In fact, whatever you are pumping, you can inject only 30% of what the, that's our research on experimental basis. So that available in anywhere on rainfall. So let us do the rainfall recharging rather than treated water recharging. Kindly look at that as a last option. Please don't put that and then make a pollution. Then it is very difficult to uh, treat it because it goes in which direction nobody knows. Uh, that's only, it's not a refutal, but I think I, I was just trying to tell you a cautioning that let us not take that as a us to resort for our That's the life. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much for uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for bringing groundwater to the center stage once again. And I think that's very important. We don't see groundwater. Someone rightly commented, so we just forget it. Like right. in your right. telephone, you keep on getting message. Your battery is going to be dead or recharged. 
so same kind of situation does not exist for ground water so we keep on over exploiting and ultimately let's really our bank you have to only take out something and then so that it gets recharged in the next season so i think rain water harvesting and linkage with aquifer recharge ground water recharge is perhaps a very very important aspect and we should really uh, give it on our top priority uh, so sanjay ji i am now giving back to you for uh, thank for you very much sir i think whatever you got for uh, sorry i we, we could not control we could not sir, i could I, not really complete it yeah. within time but please also see we started also little late then yes, what was the yes. schedule so no not only that sir i think this, but i am really very happy with the conversation i am quite yeah. sure uh, it, it has led to lot of good good points good ideas absolutely sir thank you very much for very ably uh, providing leadership to this uh, panel and i think i completely agree with you the kind of discussions that we've had probably we would have continued for another one hour maybe and then also yes. it would be uh, you know equally interesting um, and, and i think uh, the panelists uh, have provided uh, uh, i mean what a fantastic conversation discussion that we've had from all the panelists and i would really like to thank all of you uh, for being with us and contributing to the success of this uh, webinar um uh, i would like to start maybe with mr rajneesh chopra dr sunita pushottam dr t prabhu shankar professor mohan professor verva murthy and of course the chair uh, uh, mr rajiv ranjan mishra who despite being in the ministry he's been able to stay on with us for two good over two hours sir i think that is something which we uh, really want to acknowledge uh, because this is something we have very very rarely seen that people from the ministry can really stay on for such a long time so really grateful to you for being with us throughout and we hope that i you know we we would have loved to have the question and answer session because i saw some very interesting questions in the question uh, in the q and a box uh, which the participants have asked so what we will do probably is i'll ask nupur to collate them and uh, send it across by mail to various panelists and then we can get your feedback on them and put it up on our website because we will be putting up the outcomes of these discussions on our website and provide the links to you all so uh, i think that's the only thing that we can do in the interest of time so once again uh, i would like to thank you all and uh, look forward to working with each one of you uh, i think in the future uh, we at terry uh, uh, since we are in the process of uh, doing r and d i think that's something which we look forward to getting uh, knowledge and also disseminating it uh, through you all thank you very much thanks Thank one minute yeah yeah I just, yeah, no I just yeah yeah uh, so um, as you have rightly mentioned actually the discussion have been so engaging that uh, i have forgot to read the bio notes of all the speakers so this is a testimony to a wonderful discussion and forum that right from starting till end we have got so much in uh, we engage into insightful discussion so you don't i thank you to, all the nupur, members nupur you don't need to introduce them they are all stars <laughs> why are you wanting to introduce i'm them? saying that uh, uh, therefore uh, apologies if uh, you feel so but uh, it's a great learning great learning webinar and last one minute uh, i would uh, jayant would uh, like to have for thanks from iwa side yeah. jens to you yes thank you thank you very much uh, dr anupur uh, thanks to the terry as well as uh, to all the panelists uh, who are, who have been here uh, to share the uh, very insightful uh, the, the experiences is what is shared here uh, especially in, in presence of uh, mr rajiv ranjan mishra from uh, uh, from the nmcg it was it was quite a honor and uh, we from iwa indian chapter as well as the iwa india regional office we are extremely delighted uh, for the extraordinary uh, setup that was provided and uh, thank you ma'am uh, nupur uh, dr nupur bahadur who has been this bridge between uh, uh, the iwa indian indian chapter as well as the terry and here i take this opportunity to thank uh, professor mohan uh, from uh, from iwa india who is a chairman of uh, iwa india chapter and of course we have professor kalanandi vairavamurthy who is the ceo of the organization and thanks to dr uh, prabhu shankar uh, from the chennai metropolitan water supply and sewerage board uh, dr sunita from uh, uh, from the mahindra life spaces 
and uh, thanks to dr uh, mr uh, rajneesh chopra from vietech web again this it was quite a show and we are very extremely glad that iwa is very well represented in this panel and uh, we hope we can take this conversation forward to a next level in in due course of time thank you very much sir